Soil Carbon Challenge is framed as a competition to recognize land managers for turning atmospheric carbon into water holding, fertility enhancing soil organic matter. And as you may know, soil organic matter is over half carbon by dry weight and it is a tremendous reserve of carbon with many times the mass of carbon in, this, in our soils worldwide than we have in the atmosphere and that we have in vegetation. So the soil is the hub of the carbon cycle. And what the Soil Carbon Challenge is trying to do is to encourage people and support people who are creative and innovative and want to do this in managing for what we want and need. And this is a key distinction. I think, I think we're, we're often trained in managing against what we don't want, in fighting problems. And when you understand how the carbon cycle works, it's, it's, uh, it's quite an opportunity to be able to manage for what we want and need, which was a carbon cycle that turns a fair amount of atmospheric carbon through plants into soil organic matter and holds it there for a while. So we can absorb and retain water in our soils, number one, and also to enhance the growth of plants. Let me just, I want to draw a quick picture of the, a lot of people connect this with climate, and climate is definitely a part of it, but you're familiar with the uh, rising curve of atmospheric carbon dioxide. Everybody familiar with that? Okay, I'm going to... And let me just ask people, what's the number one greenhouse gas? CO2. <laughs> what has the most heat trapping effect? Which gas, which atmospheric gas has the most heat trapping effect in the atmosphere of the Earth? <laughs> Water vapor. Seth, right, water vapor. Ding, 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 ding. John Tyndall discovered that in 1859. Okay, so instead of the atmospheric carbon dioxide curve going up, this is represents, a, this is an area graph. Okay, here we have the air, and here we have soil and fossil fuels. And this area graph represents carbon and water vapor. We have more and more carbon in the air. Everybody see that? This is an area graph. We have less and less carbon in soils worldwide. We have probably five to seven percent more water vapor in the atmosphere now than we did in 1950, although it's difficult to measure, much more difficult to measure than carbon dioxide. Soil moisture is quite a bit less, although again it's difficult to measure because water changes phase all the time from solid to liquid to gas every day. It's not well mixed, whereas um, carbon dioxide, for example, is fairly well mixed in the atmosphere. It's a vicious circle here. The more carbon and water we have in the air, the less carbon and water we have in the soil. And by water in the soil, I'm talking about soil moisture, not groundwater. Soil, as you may know, holds many times the water of the atmosphere and all vegetation and all rivers. Soil, soil water, capillary plant available water is many times the volume of all the water in the atmosphere, all the water in the rivers, 
all the water in trees and plants. So this situation, think about what happened in Pakistan last year. We had a tremendous rainfall event on largely desertified soils that are not capable of supporting a whole lot of plant, that aren't, aren't raising a whole lot of plant material. That water runs off, evaporates very quickly. We have an intensification, a speeding up of the water cycle going on worldwide. The less water and carbon in the soil, the less plants they'll be able to grow, the more rapid oxidation of, of soil organic matter occurs, the more carbon and water we have in the atmosphere. The more carbon and water we have in the atmosphere, the less in soils, and it's a vicious circle. I think the solution to this vicious circle, if you will, is to get more carbon into the soil because water will follow. Soil carbon has a tremendous ability to hold open soil pore spaces and absorb water, absorb and retain water. Carbon on top of the soil, biomass, litter, this stuff has a tremendous ability to um, nurture microbial habitat immediately below the soil surface so that we have less, um, less erosion, less washing, Soil is able to absorb and retain a tremendous amount of water with the addition of, of, of biomass. So managing for what we want to need to me is managing for soil carbon. And this, as you know, the, the carbon in, in plants and organic matter comes from the atmosphere through the work of photosynthesis. And I want to emphasize the work here. What we really want and need is for the biosphere, the total sum of living organisms, to do more work. And by work, I mean literally force times distance, raising weight over distance. We don't typically understand the biosphere as doing a lot of work, but that's really what it does. That's what takes it out of equilibrium. That's what, that's what gives us the ability to feed ourselves is the work that the biosphere does. It's mainly chemical work, which is difficult for many of us to understand because we're used to seeing work in terms of a diesel engine or something noisy and loud that operates quickly. This is gradual, subtle, chemical work, the building of fuels and food for everything. The pattern of this work is the carbon cycle. By the way, it does easily ten globally ten times the work of all of our industrial energy, our spinning shafts and gas flames, easily ten times. But because it's spread out, gradual and quiet, we don't think of it as work. In other words, the biosphere just doesn't sit there looking pretty. It does work. And this is the opportunity. This work runs the carbon cycle. Fossil fuels, again, um, important and critical as it may be to reduce our consumption of fossil fuels, it's the work of the biosphere that is our big ally in enhancing the carbon cycle. And that's why the Soil Carbon Challenge is focused on helping creative, innovative, committed land managers monitor their progress towards soil health, water holding capacity, and productive fer fertile soils by measuring carbon which is easier than measuring water because water is a curve, carbon is stable, it's, it's, it's much easier to measure. Carbon cycle is driven always by living organisms. When you have living, self-motivated living organisms running a large biogeochemical cycle like this that Every, every motion of my finger, every flutter of my eyelash is driven by photosynthetically captured sugars, the carbon cycle. Microbes, plants are very important. They're all self-motivated. Even a bacteria is self-motivated. It'll choose whether or not to follow a sugar gradient. It'll make a decision. 
we can't make the carbon cycle like we want it because living organisms don't work that way. You can't tell the organisms in your gut to quit making methane. They don't listen. Whenever we're dealing with self-motivated organisms, especially on a big scale like the carbon cycle, we have to move from make to let. We have to let these creatures, microbes, plants, organisms, um, achieve their potential and do what they want to do. And the same with humans. We can't make Stan and Helen accrue more carbon in their pasture. But maybe we can let them. And part of the challenge idea is to do that with good monitoring. The creativity, what Stan and Helen decide to do here, that's their creativity, that's their commitment. But we can, we can um, help them by letting them know what they're actually doing in terms of um, measuring change and progress. So that's the idea of the, of the soil carbon challenge and very happy to be here and honored to be um, here at Three Springs Farm and, and thanks Stan for stepping forward and we're, we're perfect as, as he's I think Stan understands this very well it's not just a cutthroat competition. What can we do to let people who are committed and want to do this and understand something about how it's done, build more soil carbon, more soil organic matter out of atmospheric carbon and hold water and retain water and ensure a high food quality. I have a one of the posters for our um, soil carbon challenge shows an elephant with all the major problems, environmental problems, listed as uh, parts of the elephant or puzzle pieces or cuts of meat, if you want to say. Climate change, food quality extinctions, floods, food security, economies and communities, droughts, desertification, invasive species, scarcity conflicts, pollution, one could go on and on and on. But the question we're trying to ask is what are the incentives for dividing an opportunity, in other words, the opportunity to enhance the carbon cycle, into multiple competing problems? And we find a lot of agencies and some organizations even doing a lot of boundary maintenance between these problems. This is my problem. We have soil problems over here. This is the Department of Water problems. This is the Department of Community problems. It's really all a carbon cycle, folks. So and you don't have to be part of this fragmentation. We can, we can move toward managing for what we want and need instead of against what we don't want. So that's the opportunity of the Soil Carbon Challenge. And thanks Stan and Helen for stepping forward. <laughs>